Hey guys, my name is Frank and this is the Poth on Programming Video Log and today I'm going to be going over a couple different things that I programmed into this endless runner game that I made when I was sick. I got sick and I sat down and I just started programming and this is what I made. So it's amazing what you can do with a little bit of time when you have time. So I made this endless runner and I just want to go over a couple different things. The first thing I want to go over is object pooling because that's pretty useful. The second thing is, as you can see now, as the meteors are on the screen, there's a red tint that comes onto the screen. Um, and the final thing I want to go over is just scrolling because the background scrolls, and I don't think I've ever gone over that before in any of my tutorials. So the background scrolls and actually generates a new column of tiles every time this column goes off the left of the screen, a new column is generated and comes onto the right side of the screen. So what you're seeing here is a 16 by nine map, but there's actually a 17th column over here. So I'm going to go over all that in the code right now. So I'm going to hop up to the top of my application here. And the first thing I'm going to go over is object pooling. So I'm going to try to find my pool class, which is here. So I'm not going to explain this how it is used in the game. I'm going to give uh, another better use case example of why you'd use an object pool. So say you have a game where you're shooting a lot of bullets and let's say you shoot a hundred bullets over the course of two seconds in your game. You're going to have to do a lot of object instantiation to create all those bullets. And then when those bullets hit the wall, you're going to cut reference to them and JavaScript is going to garbage collect all those those referenceless objects, those bullet objects that no longer have a reference to them, and it's going to delete them. So you can do it that way, but that's going to cost you a lot of memory. Using the new operator to create new objects, you need to allocate memory for that, and that is memory intensive. And then when you get rid of those objects, the garbage collection system is kind of slow, and it's going to take up some time to do that. So rather than creating new objects and deleting them every time, what we want to do is we want to create those objects and when they're no longer in use, say they explode or whatever, we're going to store them in a array that is just for objects that are off screen, they're not in use, we're just storing them. So it's kind of like recycling. So when your object is no longer useful, like say when this tar pit goes off the left side of the screen, I'm storing that tar pit in an array. And when I need it again to generate a new tar pit, and one will come onto the right side of the screen anytime now, that tar pit that just went off the left side is stored, it comes back on the right side. And when I need it again, I just reset its values to be over here and I change the width and height of it a little bit. So pretty useful for recycling objects. So how does it work? I'm gonna get into the code right now. The get function either, well, the get function basically just gets a new object and fills it with the parameters that we supply. So say we wanna change the X and Y position of an object that we're getting from our object pool. You just hand that in through your parameters object and we check to see if there's an object in the pool. If there is, we pop it out of the pool. We reset it with those new parameters. And this is going to uh, assume that your objects have some sort of a reset function on them. It's going to need your objects to have maybe one or two different functions applied to them so it can actually work with them more easily. Uh, it's going to push that object back into your active objects array. And if there aren't any objects in the pool, we're actually going to create a new object with the specified parameters. It's pretty simple, not very difficult. The store function, just as simple, it uses index of to find out if an object we're removing is inside of the act active objects array. If it is, our index value is not gonna be equal to negative one. So we're just going to splice that object out of the active objects array at the index. We're gonna say remove one of those splice returns an array with the object that we spliced out inside. So we're just going to push that object into our inactive pool of objects that we're just going to save to recycle later. Store all just takes all the objects out of our active objects array and pushes them into the pool. So this is it. This is the, the whole function or the whole class for a pool class which you can use in your game. And it works pretty well and it will save you a lot of memory. So I suggest you go ahead and use that. Now I'm going over this stuff kind of fast because there's a lot of code. I mean, if I scroll down to the bottom, I think there's 836 lines of code. 
And it's a lot of white space in comments, but it would take me an hour to go over this entire video. And since I'm doing it all just off the cuff, I have to do a lot of different takes. Too lazy to write scripts. So you're just going to have to bear with me here. The next thing I'm going to go over, though, is the red tint that you see on the screen. So I'm going to try to find where I draw everything. I haven't looked at this code in a week or two, so it takes me a little bit to get familiar with where everything is again. All right, here we go. So the tint, the red tint that you see on the screen when the meteors appear is going to be handled by this code right here. So my buffer has already had everything drawn to it. It's had the background tiles drawn. It's had the tar pits drawn, the dinosaurs drawn. The meteors are all drawn. So basically, I have a final image that's ready to be drawn to my display canvas. But right before I do that, I want to test to see if there's a meteor on the screen. If there is, I'm going to increase the value of this tint, which is just a number, and uh, I'm going to increase it up until it hits 80. I'm going to add one to the tint on every frame. So let's come in here and show you guys what happens if I add five to the tint on every frame and my max tint is 280. Now when I refresh the screen, things are going to get really, really red when a meteor comes on screen. And it's going to happen pretty fast. So I have to wait for a meteor to be randomly generated. And now, as you can see, things are really, really red. And it kind of looks stupid, which is why I chose that nice value of 80 and increment of 1. But that's how I increase my tint. If a meteor is not on the screen, I'm going to reduce tint by 2 on every frame until it reaches 0. And if there is a tint, then I want to draw it using image data. So I'm going to get the image data array from my buffer image. And that's that everything is drawn to it, the background tiles, the tar pits, the dinosaur, everything is drawn to it already. So I'm going to get the pixel data from that. So that's going to be an array that is four times longer than the number of pixels in my buffer. <clears throat> the reason for this is every pixel stores a red channel, a green channel, a blue channel, and an alpha channel for transparency. So say I have an image that is 10 pixels wide by 10 pixels high, there's, there's going to be 100 pixels in that image. The image data array is going to be 400 values long. It's going to have four values for each pixel, a value for red, a value for green, a value for, for blue, and a value for alpha. And that's going to be on a scale of 0 to 255 for each. Well, except for alpha, which I believe is just Actually, maybe it is 0 to 255. It probably is. I'm going to say it is. But I could be wrong about that. So look that one up for yourself. But basically, four values for every pixel. So I'm going to loop through that array. Uh, I'm going to do it in increments of four because I just want to get the red channel. And I'm going to add tint to the red channel of every pixel in that array. So remember when I said uh, the colors in order, it's red, green, blue, and alpha. Right now, I'm accessing the red channel of each pixel. If I add one, I'm going to go from red to green. So now if I save my file and I refresh my page over here, when a meteor comes down, I'm going to get a green tint instead of a red tint. And as you can see, everything is turning kind of green. That's pretty cool. So now let's come over here and try a blue tint. Refresh. And now we've got blue. So that's pretty cool. So this is a really quick and easy way to add basic color changing effects to your game. And it really adds quite a bit, in my opinion, for the amount of code that you actually have to add. It adds quite a bit of awesomeness to your game. So definitely use this. Definitely wanted to show you guys that. So the next thing I'm going to show you is where I come in and do scrolling. So on every frame of animation, on every update to my game loop, I'm calling the scroll function, and all the scroll function does is it moves my background to the left by so many pixels. So I think game.speed is what I'm using here. Game.speed when you start out is equal to 3, I think, or let's just say it's equal to 3. So when you first start out, the background is going to be moving 3 pixels to the left on every frame of animation. So <clears throat> as the game progresses, game.speed game increases. So it goes from three, and as endless runners do, it gets faster and faster as you progress until finally it caps off at some top speed value. 
Um, so basically, I store the offset of game.speed and I add game.speed to that offset on every frame of animation. If the offset is greater than the tile size, so if it's greater than 16, which is my tile size, I know that I have to remove the last column and replace it with a new column on the right side of the screen. And that's going to keep old columns here being removed and it's going to keep new columns over here being generated to create that kind of scrolling effect in the background. And while I'm at it, I'm going to be generating new tile values to keep the background looking nice and random. So that's what all this does. So this over here removes the first column and inserts a randomly generated last column for the top seven rows. So if I come in here and I just remove this, let's see what happens. And keep in mind, this is just the top seven rows. There are nine rows in my map, so the bottom two right here and here are still going to be randomized. All right, so it's just jittering back and forth as it tries to scroll back 16 pixels, but since no back column is ever removed and no new column, new right column is replacing it, it's just jittering back and forth. So now I'm going to add that back in. and come down to the next part. This part replaces the grass tiles, so the columns times seven. Columns times seven, I don't know why I do columns times seven, it should be rows times seven, but whatever, columns times seven works too, I guess. Actually, that's probably wrong. Stop map .splice this .columns. I'm not gonna get into the details of this. Basically, what this does is it replaces the grass with a random grass value, so it gets the value of the right piece of grass here so the the farthest right piece of grass uh, it checks it against other values and basically it reconciles the edge of that tile with the new tile that's being placed in that new column that's being generated so to circumnavigate all of this or to nullify all of this code I'm just going to set value equal to two and what you're going to see is instead of flowers being generated on the grass here we're just going to have plain grass generated and it's pretty boring so but basically I'm just placing a new tile right here whenever we need a new column and finally I don't think I do anything to this final column down here column or row eight the final row because it's all the same it's just dirt tiles um I don't have a another graphic for dirt it's just all the same dirt so I don't even have to touch that bottom row so that's pretty handy too. So that's really all I wanted to show you. I don't think I really did a great explanation of this right here, but it's actually pretty simple if you look at it. So get into my video description, check out the link to my GitHub page for the source code and go check out the scroll function. I am definitely going to do a video on scrolling in the future that is far more in depth than this explanation was right here. This is kind of a weird case because it's just scrolling one randomly generated column in whenever the old column needs to be removed so it's kind of a weird case kind of a, a weird thing to explain it took me a while to figure out how to program it but once i did i was like eh, it's not that hard so check out the code on my github page and fiddle around with it heck download this entire thing and make your own game out of it it's basically a fully fledged endless runner game already it just needs sound uh maybe you should probably change the graphics up a bit this way you don't look hacky. Um, graphics set is included though right here if you want to fiddle around with everything the way it is right now. So got quite a few cool graphics for my dinosaur and the meteors and stuff like that. But just a tiny graphic set and that red effect really does quite a bit of work to make the game look more interesting and visually appealing. So all right, so I think I, I went over everything there. The only other thing that's different in this game is I use a fixed time step loop. I'm going to make a tutorial on that as well. And I believe my controller object is changed a little bit too. But honestly, I can't remember. So anyway, I hope you guys learned something from all this. Hope you guys go check out the source code. I really just wanted to make this video to show you guys this example and how easily you can make an endless runner game I mean, 836 lines of code with lots of white space and comments. That's nothing for a, a nice, simple, endless runner that looks pretty good.
So hope you guys enjoyed the video. Stick around for more videos later, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.